안녕하세요. 글로벌 시장에서 통하는 투자법을 알려드리는 뉴욕나우 한국경제신문 강영현입니다. 오늘은 BCA 리서치의 수석 주식 전략가인 라이린 둥켈과의 인터뷰를 준비했습니다. 둥켈 전략가는 BCA에서 미국 거시경제 관련 연구를 하고 있고요. BCA 오기 전에는 프루덴셜, JP모건, 시티그룹 등에서 근무한 거시경제 전문가입니다. 오늘 인터뷰에서도 페드 정책을 비롯해서 미국 시장 전반에 대한 이야기를 들어보도록 하겠습니다. Hello, Dunkel. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Okay, my first question is about Fed. Some experts expect the Fed to raise interest rate by 50 base points in June and July, but it will stop by September. Will the Fed stop rate hike ahead of the midterm election? What do you think about this? I actually have a different opinion. I don't think that the Fed will stop. I think that uh, the Fed has uh, telegraphed that it is laser focused on inflation, and inflation is still way far away off from the target 2%. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a long runway before we actually hit the desired numbers, numbers that the Fed would like to see and uh, what consumers would like to see in the US. So mm-hmm. I think it's going to be uh, a long pass towards, towards sort of normalization. And I do expect the Fed to be um, hiking uh, for a while longer. I think that uh, they have preordained the pace initially that they will go sort of fast at the beginning. They will front load the cycle, but I don't think they will stop. And when we talk about the election, I think that uh, for the current administration, uh, inflation is really uh, the top of the concerns. And this is what they worry about in terms of winning the election and retaining the House and the Senate. Inflation is akin to a regressive tax. Because it literally affects absolutely everyone in the country, but people who uh, make less money in the bottom quintiles of uh, income distribution are affected the most because their inflation basket uh, is dominated by food, energy, and shelter, all of which have gone up a lot. And even though the bottom quintile and two bottom quintiles of workers had the highest, uh, highest wage increases, These wage increases are really lagging inflation, and they probably experience the most negative real wage growth of all American workers. So to win the election, the government, the administration, and both the Fed have to continue signaling that inflation tops all of their concerns, Mm -hmm. and they want to uh, preserve sort of um, the level of living for uh, for all Americans. Okay, I I agree with you. And if we wanted to predict the Fed behavior, we think we must talk about inflation first. More specifically, the concern is higher inflation rate drive more monetary tightening. If they overshoot and slow down too much, we will end up with a recession. As you told before, you don't think inflation is not peaked, right? I think that inflation has peaked. Um, but I think it's still, it peaked off very high levels. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it will take uh, a while for inflation to actually reach uh, the levels that are acceptable uh, Mm -hmm. to the Fed. Uh, But I think that inflation probably has turned on the back of many different developments. First of all is the base effect. Inflation started going up quite sharply last summer. So comparables Uh, are much easier now because we're comparing with the high level because, for for example, until, um, you know, a few months ago, we were still comparing with the sort of pandemic-ridden economy kind of inflation. So now we're comparing with, you know, inflation that was on the rise. So inflation will turn just because of that. Second reason inflation will be turning is because demand for goods have been pulled has been pulled forward and now it is being kind of starting to fade because it kind of has been met. So people demand less goods, more services Mm -hmm. um, and demand for goods is actually um, an inflation prices of good. They actually are very, um, prices are very liquid because, uh, you know, sellers, manufacturers, they can actually change prices of goods very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I do think that based on that, inflation will start to come down. Uh, But we also have services inflation, which is stickier. Mm -hmm. And now consumption is uh, is shifting from goods to services. And it's starting to affect, you know, sort of other parts of the market. So I don't think it's just as easy as demand for goods coming down. Inflation will be coming down because uh, American economy is actually uh, dominated by services. 
Okay, then when do you think the price is normalized? I think it is very hard to say because there are so many uh, factors going into that. But uh, my hunch is that it probably will take a couple of years for inflation to actually hit 2%. And the uh, U.S. has a very tight labor market and it's feeding into inflation. At the same time, although it is still tight, some said that the situation seems to be changing, such as announcing job cuts to some company recently. What is your forecast about labor market? I think that you're quite right. The uh, hot labor market was one of the reasons for inflation spiking. So we were uh, writing about the wage spi uh, price spiral for a while now because as prices rise, inflation expectations are becoming more embedded. And so workers go to their uh, employers and they ask for raises. And because there is a great shortage of workers and the labor market is so tight, uh, employers are afraid of workers quit quitting. Mm -hmm. So they're willing to increase wages or actually workers quit and they go elsewhere where they get more money. Um, but then employers are trying to pass on this wage increases towards their own customers. And that's how we get to the spiral. So the market is really very hot. Uh, perhaps it's starting to slow because one of the main ways how the Fed can sort of stop inflation is to slow the economy. And they really need to cool uh, down the labor market. So in a way, I think that what we, are what we see happening is probably a positive development. We still have about 1.9 um, job openings for every job seeker. So the market is still very robust. And I think that one of the sort of key premises, one of the uh, basis for uh, the Fed's case for soft lending is that the labor market is so hot that they can cool it down without calling, causing you know, a major spike in unemployment uh, and uh, recession. So I think that labor market will be cooling again because uh, demand for goods is starting to slow and uh, inventories are building up. And so companies like Amazon, you know, they're saying that maybe they will be overhired. We're not going to lay off people yet, uh, but we probably have enough people because our business is slowing a bit. And I want to uh, ask about recession possibility. What do you think about the possibility of recession and stagflation? Some people very worried about it, and the others said recession risk is rising, but we are not there yet. What is your opinion? I do think that recession uh, risk is rising because uh, Fed has rarely been able to achieve uh, a soft landing. And also, if you listen to their rhetorics, they're saying that initially they said, well, we want soft landing. Then they said, we want softish landing, which implies that it's not quite as soft. So what is a soft landing? You're able to uh, slow down the growth or slow down you know, economic growth and inflation without causing uh, a major spike in unemployment. So first they say soft and they said softish. And the latest, uh, you know, language was that um, taming inflation may actually involve some pain, which means they, they do full well expect unemployment rate to uh, go up. And that kind of speaks towards the possibility of a recession. However, um, I think that recession definitely not imminent in the sense that, you know, it may happen. Uh, but it's only a probability, so there is no certainty of that. And I believe that what is probably um, a more immediate concern for the market is actually a slowdown in growth and a negative growth surprise. So recession actually implies negative growth. But I think that if growth you know, remains, uh, remains positive, but underwhelms expectations, underwhelms investors, I think it will actually uh, be a major... Um, it will be quite damaging for the equity markets. So I think it's all about anchoring expectations. It's all about meeting expectations and failing to meet expectations uh, is actually my immediate uh, concern. And also I believe that as we discussed, as inflation is turning and growth is slowing, um, the concern and the focus of investors is actually starting to shift from inflation to growth slowdown. And I think it's a major change in dynamics. Okay, and then uh, we... Uh talk about more specific uh, issue, the market. Uh, if look around the market, uh, are there any companies or industry that you are particularly positive or negative on? I have been um, 
adding defensives to my portfolio for a while, and I was advocating sort of a more balanced allocation between cyclicals and defensive because with a heightened uh, portfolio volatility, portfolio needs to be well diversified. And uh, for investors that are actually managing to the benchmark, I would, uh, again, advocate staying closer to the, to the benchmark because it's not time to be a hero. But looking forward, I do expect the market to be what I call fat and flat. Uh, the market will be going up on hopes that inflation is subsiding and the Fed will go easier. And then we may hear from the Fed, who's, you know, which may say that, no, well, we already uh, decided sort of on the path of tightening and this is not enough reason to um, let off. And so I believe that um, the market will be up and down a lot over the next, say, three to six months, uh, rallies and pullbacks. And in such an environment, again, probably the best to have a well-diversified portfolio because during the rallies, even if they're short-term rallies, I think that most beaten up stocks will uh, start to outperform. So I think today we see technology performing in the US. So kind of growth stocks, uh, long duration stocks, stocks that have lots of their profits far in the future. Um, many of them have lost lots of value over the past three months. And I think they will be probably market leaders in the rally. But when the market up, uh, and another thing to add that, um, areas of the market that have made the most money over the past sort of uh, three, four months from the beginning of the year, such as energy and materials, will be the first to um, give up uh, their gains. So on that premise, I would say that it's important to have some of technology stocks in the portfolio so that uh, portfolio is actually keeping up with the rally. Uh, but I would also retain some of the defensive, such as, um, you know, healthcare, perhaps uh, consumer staples, perhaps uh, to have that, you know, sort of ballast in the portfolio to reduce volatility and to reduce losses on the down days. So I think that uh, probably pass forward, uh, is having a little bit of everything because um, I don't think that the market um, is at the beginning of uh, a long-term sort of rebound. I still think that it's kind of looking for a bottom, kind of bouncing because no one really knows where is the bottom. No one knows exact value of the market. So the market is still testing. And I think that there's still some conditions that uh, prevent the market from a sustainable rebound um, because uh, expectations both for earnings and for economic growth are still elevated. They have not really been adjusted. A lot has happened since the beginning of the year. Uh, but what an analysts expect in terms of earnings is still the same 10% as it was back in January, 10% earnings growth over the next 12 months. So I think that these numbers probably will come down. And if they don't, there will be some growth disappointment. There is a probability of an earnings recession going forward because there is great pressure on companies' margins. So I think that we are still probably several months away um, from, you know, kind of more clear sailing in the market. So for now, it's volatility. And for now, best, uh, you know, to protect the portfolio. Okay, then the stock market has been very volatile this year. And how should the investor respond to this situation? Is there a chance to buy the dip or selling opportunity when it rebounded? I think that uh, for long term investors, it's probably better to if we avoid, you know, trading too much in this market, because uh, it's very hard to time the market. So it's probably better to kind of uh, stay put and not go into sort of speculative areas of the market, even though it might be tempting because you may see some of the stocks going up 10% on a day. But I think that these gains can potentially be very short-lived because we do still have an environment where Fed is tightening and stocks that have gone up uh, over the past ten year, over the past two years on liquidity injection because we had uh, extraordinarily easy monetary and fiscal policy. I think now we're experiencing uh, liquidity withdrawal from the market, like quantitative tightening, we don't expect any fiscal easing. So I think that what has come up probably is still coming down. And I think, still think that uh, conditions are not favorable uh, for equities. And I'm not advocating completely to stay out of the market, but I would still, my advice would be to be careful. And I have actually um, a presentation, uh, which I titled Keep Calm and Carry On. So I would suggest keep calm. Um, still avoid um, 
very risky parts of the market, uh, stick to growth companies that quality growth, companies that are likely to deliver growth in all kinds of market environment, even if growth is slowing. And I think that, you know, after a while, this kind of um, uh, positioning will pay off, probably the safest way, you know, to sail uh, in these muddy waters. Okay. Uh, Korean individual investors are most, most interested in U.S. tech stocks, such as Tesla, Apple, and NVIDIA. When I interviewed with Doug, uh, he said he had an equal weight on tech stock. What do you think? I agree with Doug. Uh, I'm a little bit more granular in my allocation just because uh, I am a U.S. equity strategist, so it's kind of my job to be granular. And within tech, I'm overweight software and underweight semiconductors and hardware and equipment. And the reason for that is uh, hardware and semiconductors are actually the more kind of cyclical areas of the technology sector. They are highly geared to economic growth and they're highly geared to this, you know, demand for goods that we have experienced over the past two years. When people were buying new computers, people were buying gaming computers. So NVIDIA was soaring because, you know, all the gamers sitting at home wanted this, you know, super advanced chips. Uh, and now I think uh, much of the demand has been um, kind of mad. People have a little bit less money because there is actually pre- pressure uh, from um, inflation rising for necessities. So I do believe that uh, these more cyclical areas of the technology sector probably face not only you know headwinds in terms of monetary conditions and you know rising rates and you know tighter federal uh, tighter you know monetary policy. Uh, they also had face real headwinds from the slowing growth. However, I'm positive on uh, software stocks. Um, they are slightly more stable. They are kind of a little bit of uh, more of safer growth. Uh, this is the area of the market that is exposed to digitization of the economy or migration to the cloud. And a lot of that has already been happening and pandemic has accelerated some of the trends, but there are still many more companies, smaller companies, mid-sized companies that are moving their operations to the cloud. And the industry is transitioning from sort of on-premise and support model towards subscription model. And subscription model is basically getting, um, you know, revenues in infinity, in perpetuity. And operational leverage is huge because once you kind of set up the cloud, the marginal cost of every additional uh, client is very small. So I do believe that these companies will deliver very stable sort of lucrative growth um, and earnings will be strong. And so I'm overweight software and I'm underweight, you know, more cyclical parts of the tech sector. May I understand that Microsoft is better than Apple? I would say so. I mean, Apple has an amazing franchise and everyone wants an iPhone and, you know, my children always want an iPhone. Uh, But on the other hand, lots of these iPhones have been bought. And when people have a little bit less money, you might argue that, you know, you will tell your teenagers, say, okay, you know, maybe not this year. You can, you know, keep your phone for another year. So I think that consumer goods generally going to be under pressure just because the purchasing power of most, you know, middle class Americans and lower income Americans has been impaired and probably the same thing uh, for the rest of the world. But Microsoft has a great, you know, also has a great brand, great franchise. And what migration to the cloud actually helps companies, it helps to increase productivity and it helps companies to actually manage their costs. So whether the economy is going up or down, improving productivity and managing costs is always a winning proposition. Okay, thank you, Dunkar. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insight. It's my pleasure. Great inter- interview of wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.